Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Pater Podcast. I'm Tom Hannafin. I am without Matt McGloin today because Matt is having a baby. Uh, he and his wife, we were thinking we're expecting uh, their second child to be arriving sometime next week. However, things happen. So I am flying solo today, but we have a great edition of Pater in store for you. I'm going to get you guys up to speed on some of the headlines this past week, uh, especially regarding the transfer of running back Noah Kane. We're going to chat about that a little bit. And also, this episode is focusing on Penn State's quarterback situation as we head into 2022. And with that, Matt and I have a great interview that we recorded with former Penn State quarterback coach Charlie Fisher to give us some insight into what goes into coaching quarterback Quarterbacks dealing with personalities, considering Penn State is going to have four very interesting quarterback prospects all in the same room heading into this season. So we're going to dive into all that here in a second. But thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing and turning on notifications. Bet online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as the playoffs continue. Bet online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. It's a new year. And with a new updated desktop and mobile website, you can sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. The Pater Podcast is presented by Bet Online, where the game starts. And of course, Funk Brewing is the official craft beer partner of the Pater podcast. I know Matt's probably going to have a few of these considering what this week has been just to take the edge off a little bit. But honestly, I'm a huge fan of Funk Brewing. Definitely check out their Citrus IPA and their Silent Disco IPA. They have a lot of different styles and flavors for all types of beer drinkers. 50 plus options over time, if my math is correct. You can find Funk Brewing at your favorite beer distributor and grocery store. Trust me, their fresh, funky flavors will satisfy your craft beer loving taste buds. For more information, visit funkbrewing.com to learn where and how you can get their fantastic products. You must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. All right, so this is uh, a little interesting for me, but thank you all for tuning in. As I mentioned, we're going to get to that interview here in a matter of seconds in regards uh, to uh, Charlie Fisher. I can't wait to get his insight. Charlie was the quarterback coach, for those that you don't know, during the 2012 and 2013 seasons. He worked directly with Matt McGloin. He had an opportunity to work with Christian Hackenberg. He had firsthand experience, actually, in the recruitment of Trace McSorley and is a lifelong Penn State fan. So he is a wealth of information in regards to the history of this program program. So this is a great interview that we have. Um, arguably the biggest and the only real headline regarding Penn State football in the past week uh, was the departure in the transfer portal of running back Noah Kane, who this past year had the most rushing touchdowns uh, on the team with four. Uh, Noah Kane has had a very challenging number of years. There was some promise uh, that you could see early on in his time at Penn State, but a number of injuries seemed to pile up. And then just the competition in the backfield for Penn State, whether it was Devin Ford getting involved at points, and then you had Kevon Lee starting to emerge, and then uh, uh, Jordan, uh, oh my gosh, Lovett, uh, transferring in from Baylor. Lovett also contributed last season, so it got to be a very crowded quarter uh, running back room, and now you can see Noah Kane is transferred. He is off to LSU and joining Brian Kelly down there. Now, Noah Kane is a Baton Rouge, Louisiana native, so it makes a lot of sense, and an opportunity to go to a team that had a real down year last year and might have an opportunity to contribute as his eligibility continues to dwindle. Also, you can understand the decision because Penn State's running back core is as follows as of right now. Of course, you have Kevon Lee, you have Keziah Holmes, you have Devin Ford, um, you have running back Tank Smith, a redshirt junior from Pittsburgh. And then you cannot forget about the incoming freshman. There's running back Katron Allen, who's really blown some minds out of IMG Academy. And the bell cow that everyone is talking about is Nick Singleton. Gatorade Player of the Year is somebody that a lot of people expect to be a transcendent talent at running back. So you can understand 
the exodus from the running back core to a degree uh, because of these incoming freshmen. So I'm very curious to see, A, what Noah Kane is able to do at LSU. We wish him the best of luck. But there is some real talent in this running back room, and it's a question of now Kevon Lee, would, who appears to be the incumbent starter, six foot, 240-pounder, offers a very different style than Katron Allen and Nick Singleton. But – the potential, the hype is all certainly there. And then you have to question, well, are Smith, Ford, and Holmes going to make this really interesting? So that's going to be a fascinating story to keep an eye on. And I've said it before, when we get to the blue-white game in the spring, not only are you going to be paying attention to the running back situation, but also what's going on at quarterback. We have discussed this uh, at length on this podcast, and obviously Sean Clifford is back for another season of eligibility in 2022. He's going to be joined, of course, by Christian Bayou, who had a nice showing against Rutgers this past season and a win. And you've got Speaking of incoming freshmen, guys like Drew Alar and Bo Prabula, there has arguably never been more competition in Penn State's quarterback room in recent memory. So with that, Matt and I thought it would be good to reach out to an expert who can give us a little bit of insight in terms of dealing with talent of that caliber, what goes into coaching and training quarterbacks, educating them, and also the fascinating career of Charlie Fisher, who's absolutely done it all and is certainly somebody that I would consider to as as a fan to be a Penn State lifer. So I'm very excited about this. So without further ado, let's get to Charlie Fisher. I do have one kick and quick note, however. All of us involved in the Pater podcast are proud supporters of THON, also known as the Penn State Dance Marathon. THON is a year-long effort dedicated to raising funds and awareness for its sole beneficiary, Four Diamonds at Penn State Health Children's Hospital. THON is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world committed to enhancing the lives of children and families impacted by childhood cancer. Four Diamonds picks up where insurance leaves off to relieve financial stress and provide emotional support so that no family ever has to see a medical bill. Since 1973, THON has raised over $190 million in the fight against childhood cancer. And in case you weren't already aware, THON intends to hold THON Weekend 2022 in person from February 18th through the 20th at the Bryce Jordan Center in University Park, Pennsylvania. To learn more about THON Weekend 2022 or to donate, visit THON.org. That's T-H-O-N dot O-R-G. It's all for the kids. Make a difference in the life of a child today. And a special thanks to my friends at the Mac Mania podcast on The Ringer, who were good enough to make a donation this past week as I joined them on their broadcast. So thank you for donating to Thon. And on another personal note, I want to take this opportunity to put a spotlight on mental health with a new initiative called Tag Me In. Tag Me In is simply asking for people to tag in on the conversation and help strip away the stigma around mental health. Whether you're looking to lend support, you want to talk, you want to share, maybe you need some help. We invite you to join in on the conversation. We encourage you to make a video if you'd like, post it on your social media channels and use hashtag tag me in and hashtag tag me in United. At the very least, we want to hear from you. You are not alone. Tag me in. Visit tag me in United dot com to learn more. And joining us now on the Pater podcast, former Penn State quarterback coach and a man with nearly 40 years of collegiate coaching experience. Charlie Fisher joining us here. I know Matt is very giddy about this one because you were his quarterback coach at one point. So uh, looking at the current landscape, Charlie, of what it's like to be a quarterback in college football now in 2022, mm. I mean, it just feels like so much has changed. And even since 10 years ago when you were coaching Matt, what's your perspective? Well, I mean, there's, there's two things that are in play there, and that's the uh, – the name image likeness, right? That's that's changed the whole game, particularly for quarterbacks that are at the, you know, the heaviest recruited players are getting all these deals. And and uh, I just hear a couple of tales out there, a couple of buddies of mine that had, you know, have highly recruited players or sons, and it's crazy what's going on. And then the transfer portal changed the whole deal. It's like college football free agency. So I, I personally, I'm not a big, big fan of it. I mean, I understand that sometimes guys have to transfer for reasons, but I, in the big picture, I don't think it's good for college football. It might, maybe the kid thinks it's good for him. I don't necessarily think it's good for the overall picture of college football. Yeah. And I think taken... you're going to see some changes there. I really do. I think you're going to see some changes, maybe a little bit on, on tweaking of some of those rules. 
Oh, I completely agree with you. I think it's a little bit of the Wild West right now in terms of what they are capable of doing. And even within your own career, as I mentioned, you were transient to say the least. So you were bouncing well, yeah. around from school to school. So well, <laughs> for, those that, for, for, for those that don't know your history, uh, according to your Wikipedia page, uh, you started in 1982 and it's virtually every year, every other year, you were bouncing around to a different school, a different job title. Um, walk us through your experiences. Well, you know, actually, you know, it's, I, I started in 1981. I coached one year high school football right here where I grew up at uh, Hughesville High School. And still to this day, stay in touch with a number of those players that I coached on that team. I mean, I was literally 21 years old, right up, right out of college. And uh, but I, you know, I always wanted to get into college football. And uh, I started in 82 at Eastern Kentucky. I was working on a golf course at, and uh, I just got married. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're trying to make that transition from college. You need a job, right? Your parents want you out of the house. They want you to like <laughs> they want get you to out. capitalize. Yeah on your college degree. I'm a substitute high school teacher. I'm trying, and I, I get a call from Eastern Kentucky to go down there as a graduate assistant. And uh, I had no idea other than I knew Eastern Kentucky was really good. They were kind of the dominant division one double A as it was called then. Now it's FCS, but they were the dominant team. Roy Kidd was the head coach, legendary guy, 300 uh, wins. So that's where I kind of started my career. An interesting story there. I show up, I'm a young looking guy. I show up, I walk in the football office, and and uh, Teddy Taylor, i never forget this, one of the assistants, he looks at me and he says, hey, are you the new punter we just signed? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 that's not me. So, you know, I I, I was, uh, I helped with the running backs. I, I worked over, I was teaching classes, I was taking classes. That's kind of where it all started for me. I went to Ole Miss, uh, Billy Brewer, two years and then the, the neat part about for me is I spanned a, a career of coaching at small college football, you know, all the way to, to the Penn States and Arizona States. But I started at an NAI school at the time. Lenore Ryan's not that now. They're, they're a Division II school. But that's the thing I'm most proud of is I had a chance kind of to work my way through the business. I didn't start at the top. I didn't start at Penn State. I started at a small school. But it was really the best thing for me. And I really learned how to coach, how to recruit. And, uh, you know, so many times everybody wants it right away. Well, you know, Matt, you know this better than anybody. You walked on at Penn State, right? You earned everything you got. And I just think that's the way life is. You have to earn it. Uh, it's just nothing's given to you. So I spent close to 40 years in the business. I was uh, kind of did everything I wanted to do. I called plays as coordinator, quarterbacks, wideouts, head coach, kind of got a chance to see it all, do it all. And along the way, I coached some really, really neat kids, uh, that, that went, some went on to play professional football. Many did not, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Now, we were talking about this a little bit before we got started, and I was kind of making light of the amount of stops that you've had. But, you know, obviously when you start a new job and you've got your Penn State hat on, which we very much appreciate, um, they just give you tons of gear for the team that you're working <laughs> yeah. for. So how much have you accumulated over the years from a million different schools, it feels like? And then how often do you have to purge and donate stuff or give it to friends? Like th that is kind of something that's just not talked about is that you just see these guys on the sidelines like, oh, they got all the colors and gear on. But it's just piling up in their house. Right. Yeah. I and mean, I kept some of it. Some of it I got away. I mean, I've got I still got a pair of shoes from Miami, Ohio in 2011. <laughs> crying out loud, you know, but there I like them. They fit good. I liked them. You know, the neat part, I've had uh, Adidas, I've had uh, Nike, never was on in a, at an Under Armour school hmm. at all. So I never never had the Under Armour gear. Uh, gave some of it away. I spent nine years at Vandy, so that was my biggest accumulation. Gave a lot of that away. Uh, I, I could have gave, like, my Penn State gear here to all my ne nieces, nephews, you know, cousins. I mean, I could have given that all away. I kept some, gave some of it away, but uh, – I've accumulated a lot of gear over the year. Too much, to be honest with you. Little little memories, little mementos, so to speak. Um, Matt, what do you remember from your time having Charlie as your your quarterback coach? It must be weird for me to call him Charlie in your presence. Coach Fisher, I imagine, is what you called him. Hey, that's the Penn State way, though, right, Matt? Hey. You're coach Paterno. Hey, Big Fish, man. I call him Big Fish now. You know, <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> But no, at, at, yeah, at the time, you know, it was Coach Fisher. You know, and obviously – you know, Coach Fish and I, we, we've kept in touch over the years. And, you know, uh, Coach, every time we, you know, we talk on the phone, I always tell you, you know, the impact you made on my career, 
you know, I mean, you saved my career, you know, the ability to, to come into Penn state and to be able to help me change so much mechanically in such a short time. Um, you know, for me, I mean, not just football career change, but life changing, right? Because I don't, if I don't make those changes, if you don't come in and help me out, then, you know, I, I probably don't do what I, what I did statistically and play as well as I did as a quarterback and get that shot of going into the NFL and, you know, understanding how to process the information, understand what it takes, you know, to, to change protections and to, and to know what to look for in, def- in defenses and fronts and coverages, just to be able to process the information, you know, in a hurry. So, you know, so much of it was, you know, you and, and that Bill O'Brien combination that really enabled me to, you know, to, to play at an extremely high level. And I can't thank you, you know, enough for that. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago and I said, I think that's why you and I got along so well and why we get along to this day. We were always on the same page, you know, when it came to, you know, oh, yeah. the X's and O's and when it came to playing quarterback and understanding what you had to do at the quarterback position to be successful. Um, you know, so for me, but I want to ask you this, cause I don't think I've ever asked you this. So I want to rewind, rewind a little bit here, you know, when you, for when Bill first offered you the chance to, to go to Penn state and become mm-hmm. the quarterback coach there, like with everything that was happening at the, that time at Penn state, right. The firing of Joe Paterno, the hiring of mm-hmm. Bill O'Brien, the potential of sanctions, because when you took the job, we didn't have sanctions or anything like that. Those, those happened over that summer in 2012. Like, you know, did you ever think maybe this job isn't for me or was it always, you know, growing up where you grew up here in Pennsylvania, was it always Penn state was the dream job? No, absolutely. Never, never a thought that it was, uh, you know, like never entered my mind. And, and if, if you could have, like you asked me the question earlier about like my career and if, if you could have said to me, okay, Charlie, you know, you're going to be fired four times. You're going to have 15 jobs. You're going to travel all over the country. Your kids are going to be in multiple school, da, da, da. But at the end of the day, you're going to get a chance to spend maybe one day, but you're going to be lucky enough to get two years at Penn State. Oh, I'd bet <laughs> the farm right there in a minute, you know. to, to I used to go to games there, you know, back in the 60s. My aunt and uncle took me, ironically, and I was sitting in the wooden bleachers. Not not the not not that big high facade you see now. It's yeah. the wooden bleachers at Beaver Stadium, and I watch guys like Ted Qualick and John Capaletti, and the, you know all those great names. I mean, I was just eight nine years old. I was sitting in the end zone. It's cold, you know. The, it was where all the kids sat, you know, and it was like a five dollar ticket. And uh, my, God, you know, my that guy sounds was, great. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, nice. Matt. Do you, you remember this name? My guy was a guy, but nobody knows this guy much in, in, in Penn State history, but he's my guy, Gary Heyman. All right. Gary was a running back at Penn State. He always wore the cool wristbands. He, he just looked good, you know, and he was kind of my guy. But uh, and, and it was neat for me coming back to Penn State was to be able to become close friends with Shane Conlon. And Chuck Fusina, uh, having a chance, Todd Blackledge, yep. uh, Kerry Collins, all those guys. It was a neat part about Penn State is the connection of the former players to the program. And Matt knows this better than anybody because yep. he's one of them. Is how many of these guys come back either to watch practice, watch a game, and they love it. I mean, they're so proud of their university. And I'm just proud to be a small part of it from the coaching end. My son was a manager there for five years. Uh, so, you know, we have that connection, but certainly for Matt as a player and all the former lettermen, it, it just, it, it just is a place that is just as, is uniquely special. No, no doubt. And like, you know, even like looking to where it's at now, you know, compared to we were there and even, you know, in, in the, the years and years prior to that, like the expectations are always high mm-hmm. at Penn state, right. Always want to try to win the big 10, always want to beat Ohio state, always want to beat right. Michigan, you know? So when you got there, did you ever feel any of that pressure as a coach, like walking down Uh, that hallway, seeing the all Americans on the wall, the guys you grew up watching, walking out of that practice field, walking through the tunnel at Beaver stadium. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I don't know if pressure is the right word, but expectation, you know, you got to, you know, you got to meet, you know, like eight wins isn't enough at Penn state. I mean, that's not the expectation. No, it's that, uh, (laughs) you know, it just isn't. Uh, now, when we were there, it was uniquely different because of the sanctions. But I think uh, if you ask any Penn State fan or 
you know, Matt, obviously from being there, you know, the expectation is, is always the big 10 title, certainly mm-hmm. you know, beating Ohio state, Michigan. I mean, that's the uniqueness of it all, but I can't really say pressure, but there was a different sense And Matt, you remember this, the, the Ohio state week always brought like a little more in, I don't know to say intensity because there's always intensity because there's great expectation of Penn State. But I remember we're getting ready to play Ohio State. You remember this, Matt? And we're, we're working out there, you know, on some routes. And uh, before we know it, you and Trevor are, are kind of barking at each other pretty, pretty, <laughs> round, pretty roundly. So we, we had to settle everything down a little bit. That's the beauty of that game, though. You know, there's high expectation. There, there's a desire to win. The competitive edge comes out in everybody. And uh, – I'll tell you a neat story about Matt. We're walking, Matt, I don't know if you remember this, we're walking through the tunnel for the Ohio State game. It's a whiteout and just me and Matt. And, you know, we'll walk out of the out of the locker room. And as you get closer to the gate, you know, you can, like the buzz is getting louder and louder. There's 107,000 people in there. And they're, you know, they're getting ready for this game. And Matt looks at me, he says, hey, hey, Fish. He says, I feel like I'm going for 400 today. <laughs> But that's what I loved about Matt McGloin. That sounds about uh, right from what I've gotten yeah, that that to. Yep. <laughs> you know, edge like, of I confidence. Still, you know, it's amazing because you, you've had the opp- you have the opportunity to play in so many different stadiums, be a part of so many games. And like for me, NFL games, college games, like just, I mean, I've been, I, I played football since I was five years old. But it's, you know, when I look back on that 2012 year, like I, I'll, I'll never get over the fact, coach, that, Every game we were winning at halftime. Yeah. Every yeah. single game. We, you know, do you like, and I'd forgotten that, you know, it was eight, eight and four. I mean, I say it all the time. That's the closest I've ever felt to being undefeated. Yeah. Right? How special of a year that was, but it's, you know, I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating to think about, you know, it really is because again, as you said, like the expectations were so high, like we didn't care what we were up against. We still want it, you know, to, to win. You know, most importantly, we, can, we still demand it the best out of ourselves and out of one another. And I'm not, I'm not going to ask you for just one. So when you, and before we move on here, before you, when you look back on that 2012 mm-hmm. year, what are some of your favorite moments, favorite memories that, that come up now that you've had the opportunity to, to sit back and, and relax and, and think about your career? Well, from 212, I mean, I never forget when, when I think Matt, we were 0 and 2 and, we come out there, you know, one of the things that's unique at Penn State, you come out for quarterback center and there's 25,000 students in the end zone, you know. I mean, it's like it's like totally different than going most every other place when you come out early for a game. You know, everybody else is still out, you know, they're tailgating, but the students at Penn State, they're waiting for the quarterbacks and those guys to come out. But I never forget, we're getting ready to play uh, Navy and uh, they had a sign up in the uh, end zone, we're sticking with Ficken. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it was a great, just a, 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 I don't know, a unique uh, sign of how much the, the, like the student body stays behind the mm-hmm. players. And, um, you know, Sam Ficken, one of the great stories from that year, uh, you know, a guy that arguably struggled early, had to take over for uh, the kicker that transferred and kind of bailed on Penn State. And he had a lot on him and misses, what, four Matt against Virginia. And, um, yeah, you know, yeah, that he, Virginia he, game on the road. Yeah. And he could have easily cashed it in. Uh, and I, I think I speak for Matty here. Matt went through that same experience in the bowl game, right, against Florida. Mm-hmm. And uh, it takes a lot of men- mental toughness to overcome, you know, like failing and having a tough game. And and Sam did that just like Matt did. He hung in there. And then, you know, the great memory is when he, he kicks the game winner in overtime against Wisconsin. The snow's coming down. It's cold as all get out. And it is it is vintage Big Ten football, right? It's yeah, vintage. That's- that's and, why you uh, play in the Big Ten, that weather, yeah, he, you know. And it's, yeah. I mean, Matt remembers how dang cold it was that day. I mean, one it was cold, freezing. Games, one, of the cold, one of the coldest games I've, I've ever been a part of. And it was windy and, yeah, man, like, there's a few. And we're down 14 uh, nothing in that game. Yeah. Early. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and the wind's blowing and, and just, a, just a unique. And, and, and Wisconsin had the, the biggest football team I've ever seen in, in 40 years of coaching, a mammoth football team up front. <laughs> I mean, you know, and uh, so that that was a, a, a great, great memory. Obviously, that that game against Wisconsin, uh, the Northwestern game, 
you know, Matt, Matt runs, you know, Matt running, he's running around, he's, he's doing it all. He's throwing it. He's, he's running. You remember the slide, Matt, you slide, you get your, your knee brace hooked and, and uh, you kind of tumble over there at the pylon uh, that, that, running that down game, there. That game was, you know, uh, I mean, I don't even know how to, how to even describe that game, Tom, I'm, I'm sure you were watching it, um, you know, back then in 2012, but I mean, down two scores, fourth quarter to be able to, you know, put those drives together and score when we did. I think we scored three times in the fourth quarter. Yeah, alone. we did. You know, did. A lot, it's a lot of stress if you're a fan. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure it's even more if you're a player. Yeah, maybe the great memory from that game, Matt, is, is when we went to Iowa and we played a good Iowa football mm-hmm. team. And it may have been the best four quarters of football yeah. we put together against a, a good Iowa football team on the road. Yeah. And there, there was just a like a feeling in that locker room, there's no way we're losing this game. Yeah, you I know, because you guys knew was... how well we had to play. You know, Penn State's not traditionally had a lot of success at Iowa mm-hmm. over the years, and I think that was kind of a breakthrough moment there playing against Iowa, the way we played that night, because, I mean, we literally clicked on both sides of the ball and uh, and played really, really well. Yeah, I think we were up 38 nothing at one point. In that Something time. like that. I mean, you don't see, yeah, I, you know, Iowa doesn't lose like that at home very often. N- never, never. And that's one of the best environments to this day that it is a great I've environment ever that I've ever played in. Um, you know, when you look at you know today, coach, you know where where Penn State's at, and Tom, you know, feel free to hop in, you know, at any time here. Like when you look at what Penn State's doing now, right? I mean, they potentially have four quarterbacks that mm-hmm. people people think could play for them here mm-hmm. in twenty twenty two. Right, two big recruits, Sean Clifford. Christian Veyu, right? Both of those guys played right. this year. With the way Sean Clifford played in 2021, like if you're a quarterback coach, you're an offensive coordinator, you're a head coach, you've done it all in your career. Are you pushing for an open competition at the at the quarterback spot at Penn State? Well, I think there's – I mean, I think, that, you know, there's always open competition. I think as a player, number one, I think Sean Clifford and Matt, you – Matt, you can speak to this because you were in this situation, but I – I don't, I don't think any really good player ever thinks like they got it. You know, like there's always somebody chasing you, right? There's always somebody trying to take take your job. I was scared every day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know so, what I, I mean? mean? Like I was more I was more afraid of losing my job rather than like having my job. Yeah. You know what but I mean? I like, think, that, like it goes with it goes with that, you know, that saying where, you know, I, I fear failing more than I want right. to succeed. Right. Yeah. That's that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, but I think one of the things that, that you got to do for quarterback, and I, I think back like uh, uh, the team meeting we had in June, and if you remember this, Matt and Bill O'Brien stood up in front of the team and he said, Matt McGloin's our quarterback. And I think that inf- had to infuse just an immense amount of like uh, confidence in like, okay, this is my team now. All right, they, they, yeah. they believe in me. And, and I believe that uh, Coach Franklin, I believe that Penn State believes in Sean Clifford. Um, now I know Sean didn't finish the way he wanted to, and I don't know Sean personally, just watching him. I think he's a great competitor and, and I, I think he's got an edge to him. I think that's part of why he wanted to come back and make it right and finish the, the way he would want to. But, uh, I mean, sure. It's, you know, you know, when you play at a Penn state, there's going to be some dudes rolling in there that are good players that want your job. And he knows that. He, he knows that there's not any, any guy. It's no different in the NFL, right, Matt? They, they, yeah. There's always a draft choice. There's always somebody coming after your job. And, and Charlie, to that point, you've got Bo Perbula incoming freshman who is kind of the underdog, so to speak, in this situation. Yeah. Nobody's really talking about him, but he's getting athletic comparisons to Trace yes. McSorley. Yes. Then you've got Drew Allar, who is supposed to be the next greatest quarterback since sliced bread, you know, whatever. Uh, Christian Veyu looks solid against Rutgers, and then you have Sean Clifford. So kind of what you were touching on is, as a quarterback coach, quarterbacks have egos. So how do you balance? No, they don't. They no, they don't. No way, yeah. So how do you balance that room knowing the potential that's in that room? Great well, I think in any quarterback room, right, there's 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 a pecking order. Uh, I think everybody in that kind of knows who the guy is, and that's why at some point you have to establish who that guy is. You know, like I know my time at Vandy for, you know, the five years, well, I was there nine, but Cutler played for us for, you know, he was our starter for four. So it was no, no mistake who was the guy in the quarterback room. I think once that's established, that's a big help. If, the, if that's not established, then there there is some – sense of like uh 
I don't say uneasiness, but there's, you know, like there's electricity in the room, like who's going to be the guy. And Matt, you know, when we came in there in 212, I mean, you had, uh, I, I can't remember all the guys you were battling, but like Paul Jones, yeah. right. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Paul, uh, Paul Jones, Rob Bolden was there. Rob Bolden, um, yeah. you know, so every day there's that tension, there's tension in the room. It's not that the guys don't get along, they support each other. You know, that's, that's all part of it, but there's also a part of the competitive edge where these guys are all trying to beat each other out. So, you know, they're, it's easier once you establish it. I, you know, obviously Sean Clifford's the established starter, and I think somebody's going to truly have to, like, step up and beat him out by the way they play. That doesn't mean that can't happen, okay? I would think that, that Clifford's going to be the guy. He's going to have to, in a sense, um, somebody's going to have to step up, and he's going to have to step down. I think there would be like two steps there. He he takes a step back and the other guy takes a big step forward, so to speak. So uh, I, I don't know. I know, uh, you know, Bo played for a good friend of mine, Jerry Yunchuk, I think at Central York. Jerry's been a long time friend. He just raves about the kid. He has a lot of, he kind of seems to have a lot of Trace McSorley in him. And uh, I was at Penn State when we recruited Trace. And um, I remember Trace coming to camp and like you couldn't like you could not get that dude out of a drill, man. He wanted in every drill. He wanted to be the guy. And and that's an endearing quality. Now, that competitive edge, it doesn't matter how big you are, or whatever, you know, it just comes down to can you win? Can you can you find a way to get it done every Saturday? So, Charlie, you're, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. Tom, Matt. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, I'm following up on that. Like, in, in your experience with these competitions, these quarterback competitions, like, how early do you know who the guy's going to be? Like, do you have a pretty – because if you're asking me, like, I'm in a quarterback competition, Tom, it's like, oh, no, it's me already. I won this already. Yeah, the concept Day of you one, stepping I down won. sounds impossible. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, how, it's early, how early can you tell? Like, do you know right out the gate, like, all right, this, this is probably going to be our guy? Well, I know when and I just speak like in 2002, when I went to uh, Vanderbilt, you know, we had, in a sense, an open competition, we went there. And, you know, when you get in the building, people talk, you know, you have you usually have a leftover GA or somebody in the building and they're talking about, okay, we got, we got this local guy who, who played just a little bit for Vandy. And he's, you know, that we had an established starter. He had signed a free agent deal. We had, so we had this local guy and then <laughs> They kept talking about, yeah, yeah, we got this redshirt kid that's pretty good, Cutler. He's like kind of like he's killing the scout team. And uh, so we go to we go to into the first spring practice and like, and this guy's like, he's just throwing darts, man, all over the place. He's tall, skinny kids, you know, and the other guy, like, okay, we get in the staff room and offense and say, Well, okay, because every day we talk about this, like, like, boys, this really isn't even close. Yeah. And uh, every day, I mean, it was pretty obvious with Jay, I mean, just how talented he was. But I mean, some some days like Matt's situation and we went through the whole spring and we started mm -hmm. summer. And and uh, I, but I, what I remember about the 2012 competition is I remember that the back half of spring in 2012 was like when Matt started to take control of the job. You know, the first seven, eight days, because, as you know, it's, it's a New England offense. It's pretty tough to, you know, for everybody to learn. You know, Billy threw a lot at everybody, coaches included. And uh, I think, it, Matt, if you look back, you can think back. You, you lived it. But those last seven or eight days, I can remember telling Bus, I mean, you know, Matt really took a big step. And, and then I remember talking to the media, you know, after the spring game about, about that same thing where you really took a big step. So I think that's where I think early on in, in the spring we were like nobody, you know, a lot of reps being split. You remember that? In, yeah, uh, yeah. Seven on seven, you might get two or three throws, and then the yeah. next guy's in there, and that's pretty tough to like establish a rhythm. Oh, that's fr it's frustrating too because you want all the reps, right? And I think I remember yeah. early on, early on in that spring, coach, like, like for me, I, I, I try to break it down. Like, all right, I just got to get in and out of the huddle. What's the play? Right. Call? Give me the yeah. play call. Let me get let me get in the huddle. Let me spit this play out. Yeah. Let me get out of the huddle. Which wasn't easy. Like, which wasn't easy because it was. 30 words like yeah. you know there was yeah. there was all there was always an alert there could have been a change of protection like he always had something crazy going on in the play call but what I loved about it is he always gave me an out like right. I wasn't I wasn't stuck with something I wasn't just hey we're running this to the right side and that's it like that that was never it I always like I always had the trump card, right? I could always get us to a better play or get us yeah. something and I loved that freedom. Uh, um 
And that, but that's what I said. Like, and I would just get out of the huddle and I'm thinking to myself, all right, as I'm walking to the line of scrimmage here, let me process yep. this play in my brain. All right. And then I'll go play from there. And it just got better and better and better. I, I really believe this, you know, is, is from obviously what Matt's talking to. And then, you know, when I left Penn State, I went to Richmond and eventually was the, the coordinator at Richmond. I had a kid by the name of Kyle Laletta. You know, Kyle's still in the NFL. He's been with the Browns, Jaguars, drafted by the Giants. And then when I went to Western Illinois as a head coach, I uh, had a kid by the name of Sean McGuire who plays in the Canadian League now. And uh, But every place I've been as a head coach, coordinator, whatever, I've always wanted to see – I think you got to build your system where, and you got to have faith in your quarterback that he can see it through the same set of eyes and you let him make decisions. And, and I'm not a big fan of the look over offenses. I really believe you train your quarterback, you teach him what to look at. And, and you, at some point in time, you got to have confidence in, okay, Matt, you know what we're looking at. Check us to, you know, check us, or we're going to give you an alert. We're going to give you an either or to get yourself out, bang the alert, right? Boom, get us yep. to the next play. Because if that doesn't ever happen to quarterback, I just, I'm a big believer in that. And I think probably what helped Matt a lot in his transition to the NFL was we allowed him to, obviously he had to make Mike points. He had to run the show. So, because um, I remember when Matt got to the Raiders, he said, okay, this dude from Arkansas, man, he doesn't know what he's doing, right? You remember Matt, he came back, he said, he doesn't understand protections, just, whatever. Was, and yeah, I think- it, it was just different, like in terms of being able to process the information. Like I was just, I was a lot further ahead right. from where he was, but it's because of what I was learning that last year at Penn State. Absolutely. And I know Kyle would say the same thing at Richmond. Say, you know, we taught him how to run the offense. We taught him what to look at on defense. We allowed him to make checks. Is he going to make a mistake? Uh, probably that that's how you learn. And, you know, we always had this discussion with Bill, you know, Bill would always say, Hey, you know, even if you make a mistake, tell me what you, tell me what you see, tell me what you're looking at and tell me why you did what you did. And I think that's at some point in time, you got to allow your quarterback to make decisions. And, and I think sometimes we try to robot these kids too much now, as opposed to letting them, letting them play, letting them make checks, those type of things. I just, I think that's an important part of playing the position. It's it just, I appreciate this conversation so much considering what Penn State is walking into with four very talented guys right. in 2022. Yeah. And it just, you know, it you do want to see that maturation, at, whether it be from Sean Clifford, from what he's been able to put on tape or some of these other guys that we've talked about really um, being very early on in their careers and trying to make a jump. So we're going to have to see what happens with them. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Fish, if that's all right with you. So yeah. you were mentioning before you've been a Penn State fan or just watched Penn State football for a tremendous amount of time, then obviously yeah. you're very hands-on with a lot of guys. Not to blow smoke to present company, obviously. Yeah. Who, in your opinion, is the best quarterback Penn State has ever had? Oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. Holy smokes. That's a, that, it's man, a great that's debate because tough... everybody's got a different favorite, you know, but you're a quarterback coach, so you know what you're looking at. Man, I'll tell you what. Well, gee whiz, I have to think a little bit. You know, I mean, one of my favorite. Yeah, I mean, I have to go back to to my era. You know, I think one of the guys, and this guy didn't have the biggest arm uh, or the biggest guy, but I mean, the, the success of Chuck Fasina, mm. you know, and that he had in his seventies. Yeah. I mean, I always liked the way Chuck played. He wasn't uh, he wasn't the biggest, fastest guy. He, you know, great competitor, probably probably a lot like the guy that's on this screen right now with us, Matt McGoin, you know, in, in many ways. Um, uh, you know, I think if you look at a, a classic, like probably, I, I don't know, Matt, you weigh in on this, but I think if you look at a classic NFL quarterback, like uh, like what they're supposed to look like, what their arm's supposed to look like, it, it would be hard to debate that there probably wasn't a better looking guy or more successful guy than Kerry Collins, right? Yeah, he's mm-hmm. it, he's it, he's it. Like you know? that's like you look at him, like in the early to mid nineties, like that. You're right. That is what a quarterback should look like. Like that's like people ask me, you know, before, like how do you throw a football? Like or not like you know, I made the question like, oh, look at his arm motion. Like is that how you right. throw football? Things like that. And it's like if you want to know how to throw a football, watch film of Carson Palmer. Mm. Like that is the that is to me that's the most perfect throwing motion. Like that is how you throw a football. Who's that, Matt? Uh, Who'd you say? Uh, Carson Palmer. Oh yeah, yeah. Like that is how you throw a football. Yeah. Like that to me is the most perfect motion. But, but you, um, I mean, going back to that, like 
Kerry Collins was like, that is what a quarterback looked like. Like, no doubt he's the best, you know, arguably the best to, to ever play at, you know, at Penn state. Um, you know, and then, I mean, obviously you've had some incredible athletes like, you know, Michael Robinson. Yeah. Right? I mean, just to be able to play fullback and running back and wide receiver, and then to go and play quarterback. I mean, not many mm-hmm. guys can do that. You know, Tom Blackledge and I mean, it's Blackledge. Just, yeah, there have been so, so many. So I mean, yeah. yeah, with so many guys, and you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't. You know, obviously Matt was with me one year. Hackenberg was with me the second. Mm-hmm. You know, we know, all know Christian's success that that uh, tremendous rookie year, that freshman year that he had at Penn State. I mean, obviously one of the great seasons ever for a first year player at Penn State. And Matt knows how hard that was. You know, for for number one for mm-hmm. Christian being heavily, heavily ballyhooed, recruited the savior for Penn state in many ways. And, and then learning that offense and having to, to, to run that uh, as a freshman. But I mean, I think it's what, what makes Penn state great is, and I, we'd be, be remiss now if we didn't mention Trace McSorley. Of course. Uh, of course. You know, what, what a great career he had, you know, again, not the biggest, he's still playing. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, he's one of those guys that just like, man, throw the ball down there and let's go. I mean, that's the thing I always appreciate. He's just great competitor. You go and back for, even Daryl, Daryl Clark. I was about yes. to say Daryl. I was yeah. going to say he deserves his flowers for sure. Yeah. Um, well, well, Coach, seriously, we really appreciate having you on. And now that you're, you know, you've had a fantastic coaching career, but kind of what do you have your hands in now? We were talking about a little bit before we got started. Some some wellness stuff is kind of what you're diving well, into I, now. You know what? Yeah, I just I dabble in a number of things. I'm doing some. Obviously, I still do some some quarterback wide receiver instruction on some different fronts here locally. Uh, I do a good bit of that, uh, I, and I don't spend all my waking day doing it uh, because there's, you know I still have my 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 golf game that's got to stay sharp. <laughs> so I still play, obviously play a lot of golf, but I do do that. I do a lot of film study, doing some speaking, um, you know, some some ministry type things. We just started a thing called Fish Food, which is just we're just uh, Matt's involved with it. For anybody who wants to get involved, man, reach out to us. Reach out to Matt, the podcast, whatever. We'll get your email. Um, hey, the, the one thing that concerns me in our world today is we, we just, you know, the pandemic, we got all these things going on, who's vax, not vax, whatever. And, you know, you set that all aside, like, you know, we're, we're living in way too negative a world, man. Like life's too short to be this negative. Agreed. And I uh, just, just want to see more people just let's, let's spread some positive energy. Like let's, let's talk about what's really good about living in this country and, and getting a chance to do what we do. And uh, so we're trying to, I just, I, I sit there and said, man, we, we got to have more positive energy. And, and uh, you know, certainly I, the one thing I always, I think Maddie would attest to this, like I always made it my mission as a coach to, to like approach every day on the field, to have the energy my players would have uh, and, and to have some positive juice. Yeah. Like yep. that's something I always tried to always take on the field, not to be a negative coach. I mean, yeah, you got to get on your guys and whatnot, but just, to, you know, like Matt McGoin can't be the player we want him to be if at some point we don't infuse a lot of positive, like vibes this guy's way or, or anybody that you coach. So I just, I'm a big believer in that. You need that. And you need that too as a player sometimes, especially as a quarterback, because so much about like playing this game, being out there every single day. Yeah. I mean, you don't feel good certain days, right? Your head hurts, <laughs> your back hurts, your legs hurt. Yeah. You always need to find ways to motivate yourself. But like you also look to others to pick you up and to motivate you. Right. I mean, whether it be your quarterback coach, your head coach, you know, whether you're in a competition, um, you know, something like that. So, you know, I mean, man, positive energy absolutely is great. Like I said, guys feed off that and and guys need that. That's what makes teams great. You know, uh, Matt talked about this, you know, me and him were kind of joined at the hip. Part of that was there was some day that uh, Billy yelled at me and him at the same time. (laughs) Just to keep everybody yeah. straight, you know, but at the, you guys yeah. nailed it. It's about positivity and it is a team sport and just about everything in life. You need a good team around you. So um, coach, we are going to put the information for fish food in the description. Yeah, Put it out there. I mean, it's just yep. an email. It's pretty simple. We get your email. We'll put you on the, we'll put you on the list. It's not hard. And we're just going to send out something, you know, just, just every, every uh, two, three times a week, just something. Hey, listen, you may pass over, but it may strike a chord with you and maybe something you can pass on to somebody else. Beautiful. We're going to put the information for that in the description of this episode. Coach, thank you so much for joining us and and, uh, enjoy your, uh, enjoy your week. You guys are the best. Have a great weekend.